you want to start, everybody? Or me? Am I good? All right. Hello. Can you hear me? Like I need this microphone. I'm so loud. So I'd like to gather everybody, um, if we can, please. I just was invited to do a brief land acknowledgement and welcoming. Homo yabimi, nishinanimimi wukumni, lightum lily yapimni. Lightum lily is my given name. Um, and I'm Shelly Covert from the Nevada City Ranchery and Eastern Tribe. I'm the spokesperson, as well as the executive director of the California Heritage Indig Indigenous Research Project, or CHIRP, not quite a mouthful as the other. Um, and it's really my job to raise the visibility of the Nisenan people who are the Indian people who were here before the gold rush uh, for thousands of years. And my family has never left this place. So um, while we're not corralled on a reservation, we're still here in our homelands, which as I go out of Grass Valley more and more, I, I'm realizing is a really rare and um, beautiful thing um, that I need to be aware of that so many native people were displaced and are no longer able to be in their homelands but we are so um, we take great pride in our community and we want to be part of the community fabric again we were terminated in 1964 so we have a campaign um, for federal legislation so you, I don't know if you guys have seen that or not. Um, it would be great if you want to support the tribe, you can go to nisanon.org. I know I sound like a commercial these days. <laughs> but I'd just like to sing a song for you so you can hear a little bit more of the language. Solemnic way and numb, solemnic way and numb, solemnic way and numb, solemnic way and numb. Whoop em, yan him, whoop em, yan him, whoop em, yan him, whoop em, yan him, yap I toto, yap I toto, yap I toto. Solemnic way and numb, solemnic way and numb, solemnic way and numb, solemnic way and numb. Hui! Thank you. Thank you, and I would like to acknowledge the land that we're on here today in Nisenan territory and. Um, the plethora of ancestors who, whose spirits we believe still reside here and um, are buried everywhere. Uh, where we look, you know, we've got ancestors buried. <laughs> I know it's kind of morbid to talk about, but it's true. Um, and I know that land acknowledgements are becoming um, more and more part of our daily lives with our local governments and organizations. And so it's a great honor to be able to do that today because I usually just come up and sing and then split. And um, so to really bring some personal realization of how important it is to acknowledge the land that we're on. So thank you. Thank you. If we could get another round of applause, yes, for Shelley. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. My name is Ashley Overhouse. I'm the River Policy Manager at the South Yuba River Citizens League, more affectionately known as Circle. Thank you so much for being here. Um, welcome, either in person or remotely, um, to the second of CIRCLE's new Watershed Science and Policy Workshop Series. <laughs> Thank you again to Nevada County Department of Environmental Health, uh, especially Amy Arani over there, um, for co-sponsoring this workshop. It's made her generosity that made it, it possible to have this venue here tonight. Tonight's workshop will focus on the future of hydropower, and we have the privilege of hearing from Placer County Water Agency's Director of Strategic Affairs, Andy Fecco, U.S. Forest Service's Hydroelectric Coordinator for the Tahoe and Plumas National Forests, Amy Lind, as well as Tribal Secretary and Spokesperson for the Nisenan Nevada City Rancheria, Shelley Covert. Thank you all again for coming very much. Really appreciate it. Before we begin our presentations tonight, I would like to take this opportunity to briefly introduce the topic. 
This evening, we're defining hydropower as grid-scale hydropower, familiar to us here in the Yuba and Bear River watersheds, operated by the Nevada Irrigation District, Yuba Water Agency, and pg and &E, and similar to what is found throughout the Sierras, operated either by local water agencies like Placer County Water Agency or pg and &E. It does not refer tonight to small-scale micro-hydropower or hydropower in other regions. So just so you know the scope. Um, hydropower has advantages and disadvantages. Advantages include substantial infrastructure already in place and almost no added carbon emissions, minus the methane issues, and profitability. Hydropower can be easily controlled, ramped up and down to keep the grid balanced, and provide necessary cold water for salmon, trout, and frogs. Disadvantages include negative impacts on river ecosystems, like blocking passage of migrating fish to necessary habitat, um, rapid changes in water levels that disrupt seedling development and strand fish or frog larvae. Hydropower maintenance is expensive and impacts must be mitigated at some cost by providing stream flows, slowing changes in river levels to avoid fish and frog stranding, sometimes at low or even negative pricing amongst many other compliance requirements. But today, we are in the midst of significant changes in climate and energy markets and the impending demise of revered keystone species like salmonids and rare frogs. Our warming climate will create new demands on hydropower operations. Emerging technologies such as large-scale solar and wind power and new forms of energy storage may change hydropower's value. And then there is pg and bankruptcy to address. While demand for low carbon energy will increase as transportation and heating are decarbonized, significant new hydropower in California is questionable. Solar, wind, and energy storage will continue to expand. As the California energy pie grows, hydropower's piece of the pie, so to speak, will stay about the same, inevitably becoming a smaller portion of the pie with advances in technology. There are many questions to consider that we will hopefully address in the panel after the presentations. Hydropower is important now. Will hydropower be needed in 50 or 100 years? Can hydropower become a net environmental benefit focused on recovering endangered species and restoring healthy forests while remaining economically viable? And then can hydropower survive economically as alternatives become less expensive? These are just some of the questions our experts will explore and help us understand as the history of hydropower in the future for our community and as our community confronts new realities in the nexus of water and energy. So again, thank you for your patience and I have the privilege of welcoming Amy Lind. Thank you. Um, I don't, I don't know if I can handle all this technology, the mic and this thing, so uh, bear with me. Um, I'm Amy Lind. I'm the hydroelectric coordinator for the Tahoe and Plumas National Forests. Uh, I'm based here in Nevada City, right up the street there at the, um, at the SO, the supervisor's office of the Tahoe. And I'm going to do a little bit of a, um, background on licensing of hydropower projects, what the Forest Service role is in, the, in, those, in that licensing process. Um, and what we hopefully have gained through going through the relicensings here on the Tahoe National Forest. Um, so what is hydropower relicensing? Um, I'm going to start with a quote that's over 100 years old from uh, good old Teddy Roosevelt. The public must retain control of the great waterways. It's essential that any permit to obstruct them for reasons and on conditions that seem good at the moment should be subject to re revision when changed conditions demand. And <clears throat> that's kind of what relicensing is, <laughs> a review of those conditions. Um, so FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, uh, d provides licenses for hydropower projects that are located on navigable waters, occupy public lands or reservations, use water from federal dams, or fall under the Congressional Commerce Clause jurisdiction. And don't ask me what that is, but I bet Ashley knows. Um, <laughs> FERC is also required to give equal consideration to energy conservation, protection of fish and wildlife resources, uh, recreational provide, provide recreational opportunities, and preserve other aspects of the en environmental quality and condition. 
So licenses, hydropower licenses, um, this is nationwide, typically have a 30 to 50 year term. FERC recently sort of defined the default term length as 40 years. Um, so there has to be some different extenuating circumstances to get a longer license or a shorter license. Uh, near the end of that long license term, um, licensees can choose to relicense projects or propose to relicense their project um, using several different processes. Uh, the integrated licensing process, or ILP, has been the most common of late, although we're seeing some of the other ones kind of coming back into um, practice. So uh, I'm going to focus, though, on the ILP. That's what I've been had the most experience in and what the, the ones here on the Tahoe were all done under that ILP process. Um, so who participates in an ILP uh, licensing effort? Um, the licensee, obviously, could be PG&E, could be Plaster County Water Agency and FERC. And then the, the other sort of Relicensing participants typically include state and federal agencies like the Forest Service, Fish, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Cal Fish and Wildlife, uh, the State Water Board, um, and then uh, depending on the local community, interested stakeholders such as the um, NGOs or water districts and the and the public. It's open to everyone. Um, so the Forest Service role is somewhat unique in this um, because under the Federal Power Act. Any uh, hydroelectric or related transmission line project um, that is occupying Forest Service lands uh, is subject to what are called mandatory license conditions that are provided by the Forest Service to FERC. Um, these conditions are intended to provide for adequate protection and utilization of Forest Service land and resources. Um, this requirement is in Section 4E of the Federal Power Act, and so that's why we often refer to these as our 4E conditions. Um, you'll hear Forest Service and others use that term. Um, we can also issue uh, 10A, Section FPA, Section 10A recommendations. Uh, those are not mandatory, and they're intended to cover sort of adjacent lands or lands that indirectly connect to Forest Service, Forest Service lands. Um, both of these four E's and 10 A's are available to other some other federal land agencies like the BLM. <clears throat> and the BLM does and did participate in some of the relicensing efforts here on the Tahoe, or on their lands adjacent to the Tahoe National Forest. Um, you know, I don't expect that you could see this whole list of things. It's more just to give a sense of the breadth of these projects in California. Um, there are a total of uh, 125 hydropower license, FERC license projects in California. Um, 84 of those are on national forest system lands or national forest lands and 41 on non-forest service lands. Uh, and of those 84, 53 are considered major projects, which means they are bigger than uh, 5 megawatt generation capacity. And and as you can imagine, to have hydropower work well, you have to have water that's moving. <laughs> so the mountainous areas of California are the places where most of these hydropower projects uh, occur. And the, what the little boxes show, if you could actually see them, are for each, each box represents a national forest, and then there's a list of all the different hydropower projects on that forest. So on the Tahoe National Forest, we have four major uh, hydroelectric projects, the Middle Fork American Project, which um, I'm sure Andy will be talking more about, <laughs> and the Drum Spalding Project, which is a PG&E project, Yuba Bear Project is uh, Nevada Irrigation District, and then the Yuba River Development Project is Yuba County Water Agency's hydroelectric project. Um, the, during the relicensing, the Tahoe National Forest staff were very involved in uh, attending meetings and working on 4E conditions and pr other protection and mitigation measures. Um, and essentially, we're sort of representing the public interest in the forest and forest service resources. Um, these projects had <clears throat> completed the bulk of the relicensing, at least the parts that were most relevant to the forest service, by the fall of, 2000, of 2018. And so this is a chart that sort of shows that whole licensing process. Again, I'm not going to go through every line of it, but I will um, kind of point out the milestone where we are on all four of these is, is sort of just past here. 
Um, Andy, Andy could probably talk more about the details of this, but uh, the, for the Middle Fork project, we're, you know, we're kind of more down in here, but we're basically this, this, these, uh, after the FERC uh, environmental impact statements, final EIS statement step, um, sometimes there's Endangered Species Act uh, consultation that's still going on. There's the state water board's water quality certification that's still going on. All that happen, has to happen before FERC can actually issue a license. So of those four projects, none of them have licenses yet because we are sort of still in this, in this realm on most of them. Um, but I mean, overall, it's a, it's, it's a long, complicated process. Um, this actually lays out every single step of that process, and I'm certainly not going to go through this slide, but I just wanted to give you a sense of, of just the complexity of that um, licensing process. So what, what kinds of things could change as a result of relicensing a hydropower project? Um, the, the main things that the Forest Service and a lot of the other participants focus on are, are in-stream flows, you know, how much water is in the river at what time of the year or in, uh, or in, the, in the stream, um, downstream of the project, typically. Um, we also look closely at special status, wildlife, and plants and trying to make sure that there's appropriate protection measures in place for them. Recreation is often a very big focus uh, during the relicensing process, um, looking at both recreation, like hard facilities like campgrounds, but also uh, trying to improve access through trails and roads and access to, the, to rivers and, and reservoirs. Um, cultural resources are, are always addressed um, through, uh, typically through what's called a historic or heritage resource management plan. Um, during during the relicensing process, and uh, if we're lucky enough to have good tribal representation like Shelley, then those those plans you know have a, have a broad scope and address all all the cultural resources in the air, in the area of the project. And then um, usually there are monitoring plans that are done, or some sort of monitoring that um, to look at effects of the light of the new conditions on um, on the environment. Um, all of this is do always done, though, in the context because the ILP is meant to be a collaborative uh, process of licensing with everyone at the table, bringing their interests forward and trying to, to balance. And so we're always through in the in this particular process, we are balancing power generation needs, water supply needs, aquatic and riparian species and recreation in particular. And, and we certainly had some experiences on these projects where, at least for particular issues and sometimes for lots of issues, when those, the sort of goals and interests of the different stakeholders at the table were aligned and we could figure out how to come up with solutions that, that met everyone's, everyone's interests and everyone's needs. Uh, in particular, uh, usually there's, a, there's an improvement or an increase in the minimum in-stream flows uh, as a result of the hydropower relicensing. Uh, we focused a lot on the snowmelt recession in this area. Um, that's a, it's a, a, a very specific type of flow pattern that many, many species are adapted to. And it's, it, it's a, it's, it comes at a time of year when there's usually sort of an, I want to say an excess of water, but there's a, there's a little more water to, to kind of deal with. And so you can, there's more of it can be shared across the different um, interests. Um, also, upgrades to recreation facilities, as I was mentioning before, both campgrounds and trails and, and public access. Um, some examples of wildlife and plant protection measures are dealing with invasive species. That's often part of uh, the new licenses and, and uh, requirements that the licensees have to, to be careful with not introducing or spreading non-native species. And then um, what's become, it's become very important for the agencies to have good monitoring of all the license conditions and to be able to assess how those conditions are actually, you know, whether they're really improving the resource areas that we, we, are, we hope they were. They're doing, you know, the, the conditions are actually having the effect that we had hoped. Um, so, and this is just a cartoon that's like... <laughs> Um, it does take time to get there. I mean, I don't know. Went to, I've attended hundreds of meetings. I think probably Andy has been at least at that many. 
And uh, it, it's just a long process. Collaboration is a very long process. Um, so um, this is my one slide on the future. I know the whole workshop was supposed to be about the future, but <laughs> so my one slide on the future, uh, obviously you can tell that, you know, representing the Forest Service at least, that we feel like after the licenses are issued, there would be a lot of improvements for these different resource areas that I was talking about. Um, but obviously climate change and sort of the new developments that we're hearing about and that Andy's going to talk a lot more about in the energy markets are, are going to lead to way less predictability in the future. You know, when we did the relicensings, we thought, oh, this is how everything's going to be. And these are the conditions we're going to see in the future. And then, you know, things have, things have really uh, sh been shaken up by both energy markets and our awareness our increased awareness and the and the pace of climate change. Um, hydropower licensees, at least the ones that I've worked with more recently, after kind of after these changes in the energy markets have been noted um, or kind of experienced, I guess, more directly, there's there seems to be now a real interest in having more flexibility related to their, you know, how they would operate their projects, how much power is generated, when it's generated, both over the course of a day and seasonally. Um, but I don't think we know yet because these licenses aren't issued, we don't yet know how those new conditions, how, how much flexibility those conditions can really allow. They, they ha we haven't, that hasn't been tested yet. Um, and the Forest Service will certainly, you know, will continue to work with these licensees and other stakeholders to find solutions that address that need for flexibility. But also our mandate is to keep the protection of the public resources at the forefront. So um, I think that's it. And I'm, I don't think I'm taking questions now. I think we're doing because we're doing a panel, right? OK. That's all I have. Thanks, Amy. So yeah, Amy and I have been in a lot of meetings together. Um, I've been in too many meetings. Um, so this is a completely different presentation, but I, I want to address some of the stuff that, that Amy was talking about. Um, the super interesting thing about a relicensing process is um, there's a bunch of stakeholders in the room. We often had meetings with about this many people, in them, and um, everyone's there to represent the public. So PCWA is a public agency, so i got to represent my public, and Forest Service is there to represent the public, and... Um, uh, Foothills Water Network is there to represent the public, right? And so, um, so there's no, uh, there's everyone's claiming a high horse there, but I think we're all working um, for the benefit of the local resources and the benefit of the local citizens in many ways. And and uh, it's a little different in a in the investor-owned utility case, Southern California Edison or PG&E. That's a little bit of a different case, but but especially locally here with NID. Um, PCWA, Yuba Water Agency, we're all sort of on the, on the, yeah, I've been told I got to speak into the microphone. We're all sort of on the, on the public mission. So anyway, I'm Andy Fecco. I'm with Placer County Water Agency, um, the Director of Strategic Affairs, which means my job is to keep my general manager out of trouble, and his job is to keep the board out of trouble, and um, to keep good relations with the community. Um, so thank you, Ashley, for the invitation. Uh, this is part of our job is to get out and tell the story of water, energy, and stewardship. And so what I thought I'd do today is talk about um, market economics. Um, and fair warning, I'm not an economist. Uh, um, in fact, I'm a fisheries biologist, um, UC Davis grad. Um, but uh, I had to learn this business because uh, my job was to form um, a department within the agency to um, take over the operation of the Middle Fork project when our long-term deal with PG&E ended in 2013. They, we built the project in, um, from 1963 to 1967. Uh, they essentially paid for the project in exchange for 50 years worth of energy output. We took the water, they got the energy. And when that deal ended, PCWA had to take ownership and operate the electric side of the house as well. And we did that, and that was my job. So I'm going to talk a little bit about economics. Um, and the California energy market, I'm going to try to make this as simple as possible because it's actually very, very complicated. So the California independent system operator is the clearinghouse of energy in California. The grid in California is all connected. 
Nobody in California that's hooked to the electric grid gets their energy from one source. The grid is completely hooked together. And so you can't say that, nobody here can say their electrons come from a certain source. Everything's interconnected. In fact, the entire West Coast is interconnected from an electric grid standpoint. But it's CAISO's job to make sure that at any given moment, fraction of a second in time, that supply equals demand. And when it comes right down to it, this is all about supply and demand. Every second, in order to keep the frequency correct in the grid so that that computer runs, so the lights stay on, supply has to equal demand. And the way you do that is through economics, through price, price signals. There are different levels of generators in California, right? There's hydroelectric generators, there's nuclear generators, there's wind, there's solar, there's a bunch of natural gas. And all those folks that own those facilities are willing to turn them on at different prices. And the way you get them to turn them on as demand increases, for instance, on a summer day and it's hot and people get home from work and want to turn on their air conditioners, the price in the market goes up and new generation comes online, the next incremental set of generation comes online to cover the load. That's the simplest description of how the market works. One important piece of that is whatever the, the, the benchmark clearing price is for that five minute increment is what everybody that bid less than that actually gets paid, okay? So if you bid a dollar, you said I'll turn on at a dollar, but it took the price stack all the way up to $200 to cover the load, even if you bid a dollar, you get paid 200 okay? That's how the market works every day in California. All right, so keep that in mind as we go through this. Okay, motor market drivers. Natural gas. Natural gas is the market maker in California. A little bit over 40% of our, on any given day, of our demand is covered by natural gas generators. It is the cleanest of the carbon-emitting resources, but it still is a carbon-emitting resource. Um, so, you know, if you look at the sort of stack of dirtiness, if you will, we've sort of eliminated coal from our portfolio. We've repurposed a bunch of coal plants and turned them into natural gas plants because fundamentally the technology is the same. You use um, a thermal resource, coal, nuke, um, natural gas, to boil water. The steam turns a turbine. The turbine turns a generator head. Electrons move, right? That's the stack. And... Natural gas is really good at that, and natural gas happens to be really, really cheap. Uh, in fact, $3 for a million BTUs, um, that translates to about $30 a megawatt hour for price. That's really cheap. Um, problem, one problem, um, we're, we have declared war on natural gas in California because it is a carbon-emitting resource and we're trying to be carbon-free. Um, car natural gas is gonna be phased out of the market, so 40% of our generation that meets our demand is gonna be gone in the next 30 years or so. Serious problem, um, serious for Kaiso because they gotta balance that thing and they don't know how yet, right? So what does that mean? Um, the other thing about gas that's really good is that um, things like nuclear, when you have a nuclear power plant, it's actually really hard to change what it puts out, right? So nuclear power plants are what are called base load resources. Once a nuclear power plant is fired up and up to temperature, it's really good at holding that temperature. It's really good at boiling water at a consistent rate. And it's really hard to turn it off and it's really hard to ramp it up. A natural gas plant, a peaking unit, can go from zero to full load generally in about five to 10 minutes, okay? And so when it gets a dispatch signal from ISO, this all happens, by the way, digitally, automatically, right? So they've got a price, CAISO market hits that price, automatically a dispatch signal is sent to the unit. Within eight seconds, the unit has to return a signal that says I'm ramping up, right? And then they get paid for that increment. But it's all done digitally and all done sort of seamlessly. Um, but they're very, very good at responding to load. Natural gas units are very good at responding to load. In fact, natural gas units in hydro are the only units in California that respond to load, okay? Keep that in mind. All right, now, renewables, market driver. Huge market driver. So uh, last slide, I should have said this. Um, uh, so, so here's the, the total stack in California. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Solar, um, this is, uh, let me go back. 
Um, renewables here, 28.5% uh, um, of the average, so 12,000 megawatts, right? So that's about a quarter. There's your natural gas, 44% nearly. Large hydro, only 9%, only a quarter of what natural gas can do, right? Um, but together, large hydro and natural gas, about 50% of the market currently, and those are the responsive units. Nuke, relatively tiny. Um, imports, we'll talk about that a little bit more. But renewables, huge driver, 28.5% of the market. That's wind and solar generally, some geothermal, a little bit of biomass. So there it is, there's that stack. Um, of that section of 28.5% of renewables, um, here's how that stack looks. And it's a pretty good chunk. So 21,893 megawatts. Uh, Darren will tell you on a, Darren's my compatriot from PCWA, I'll tell you on a summer day, that's a little less than half of what we can do, but um, a huge part of our portfolio and growing. And that's some of the point of this market. So look at, here's Q1 of 2011, renewables were 1% of the marketplace. And then uh, six years later, they're 16% of the marketplace. Um, that is, and you can see it all came out of the hide, basically it all came out of the hide of thermal, right? So thermal is coal and natural gas, but in this case, probably natural gas. And, and what happened? So what happened to those thermal units? Well, um, thermal units are, are not only is there the sort of war on carbon emissions, but also a lot of those thermal units used what's called once through cooling, which they pull ocean water out of the ocean and they cool their generator head and their units and they boil the water. And then that warm water that is the result and output gets put right back into the ocean. Well, it turns out that that's pretty hard on the ocean critters and we're eliminating once through cooling. And so a lot of those units that have gone offline are the result of once through cooling. There's another 4,500 megawatts of uh, once through cooling that's scheduled to go offline in the next three to five years. So, you know, above and beyond the war on carbon, it's, it's some pretty bad stuff that's being taken offline. Integrating renewables is a big deal. So, so renewables um, are um, the greatest thing we've ever done uh, except they're the worst thing you can possibly have on a market to try to schedule around. They are non-schedulable. They don't, you cannot turn a windmill on and off when you want to. You can turn it off a little bit. You cannot turn solar on and off when you want to. And it just so happens that when the sun is shining is not when we need energy in California. That's a problem. Um, um, folks use energy. Uh, I'll just tell you my household, we get up early and uh, ramp things up. We uh, do a load of laundry, uh, we turn on computers, we cook breakfast right about in this time of day. And that happens to be exactly when the wind is tapering off, average wind, and the sun's not up. Um, and then we all go to work and there's a certain amount of energy demand during the day, there's no doubt. But because we've because manufacturing in California, which is an energy intensive operation, has mostly left the state of California because of economic reasons, uh, there's, really, there's really not high demand when people are at work. There's AC cooling load and there's some computer load, but not that big a deal. So this is not what we need, right? What we need is to take this energy and put it into the places we need it, the morning and especially in the evening when everybody gets home. On a summer day, when everybody gets home in the evening, that's when max load occurs. Everyone gets home, does laundry, uh, increasingly charges electric cars, and AC load, huge, huge AC load. And increasingly, as home electrification gets back in vogue, turns on heaters. Heating air with electricity is like the most inefficient thing you can possibly do. It takes a lot of electrons to heat air when you get home. And so, so again, solar happens when you can't, you can't do anything about it, right? And you can't store it. You can't move it to where you need it. And so renewables are non-schedulable, but yet they're firm. They're just, they act just like nuclear, right? They're really good when they're on, but they're really bad when they're off. So what do you do to manage around it? Okay, this is affectionately known as the duck curve because it resembles a duck if you squint. Um, and what this is intended to show is net load on a typical spring day. And so spring is the worst time of year for this problem because um, for over generation, because what happens in the spring is 
Days are fairly long. Think of May. You're almost at your longest day of the year. You've got plenty of sunshine. You're over the winter, so you've got no overcast. Southern California, where the majority of the commercial scale solar is installed, is already well into the, into the nice time of year down there. But you've got no AC load in the middle of the day. Right, So all that AC that was sucking up that solar and putting it to good use, that isn't there. And so what you have is a condition where you actually are making more energy than you need. You can't turn off that nuclear, right? But you've got a bunch of solar and maybe the wind's blowing. And your net, you're actually, oh, you're at this thing called overgeneration risk. And we're there now. So again, how did I say everything's scheduled? Price. Economics, it's all price. So if you're at overgeneration risk in the spring, hydro's running, runoff, snow melt, everything's turning, right? How do you disincentivize generation? You keep going, you keep lowering the price. So now you've bought some generation, but now how do you turn it off? You do the reverse. You disincentivize it by running the price to zero. And in the case of our nodes in Northern California, where there's a lot of hydro, you run it below zero. You make people pay to generate. So, so that is not in my business plan. Um, that's that whole, I to try to keep my people out of trouble. It is not in my business plan to run water through my generators and then pay the grid to take it. Um, and so, so what we do is turn off. Right, so even if we have very full reservoirs, so uh, 2017 is a good example, I think I may have a slide, is a really good example where you had a, 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 a large snow, not a, quite a large snowpack, you had a very wet year, everything in the state was full, hydro was running full out, beautiful spring, no AC load. Um, we would have been running our turbines in past years full out, just to clear the water out of the reservoirs. We'd have run it, you know, a dollar we'd have run at. We didn't care, just get rid of the water. But you had, in the middle of the day, negative prices. And so what we did was turn our generators off, and we would rather spill the water over the top of the reservoir. We, we would spill it. Why would you pay to generate, right? Um, this is a problem partly because of how we've um, incentivized renewables in the state by making them subject to, I mean, it's the way that people make their money on it is production tax credits, right, and investment tax credits. Production tax credits are a really simple thing. Every megawatt hour you generate, you get a tax credit on it, right? And so in order to stay in business, to make the business plan work for renewables and incentivize the construction of renewables, they have to be on, which means the last thing Kaiso wants to do is make the solar guy turn off. They want to take that energy because it bolsters our renewable credentials, right? It's much easier to make the gas guy turn off or make the hydro guy turn off, right? And so that's what they do with, ne with negative pricing. All right, so how do you fix it? Um, so so one, one last thing on this graph. I want you to look at this part of the day, that part of the day when everybody's getting home, okay? So, so it's one thing in the middle of the day, you might be able to manage around this with some negative price paradigms, right? You may be able to disincentivize imports from the Northwest Hydro. You might be able to manage that with pricing. Okay, this is a serious problem. Now the sun's going down. Actually, when the sun angle gets fairly low, solar starts to dive off pretty heavily, right? And so it, what happen, what's happening here is you need to come from where you were down here to a peak load in three hours. So now all those people that you turned off during the day with negative pricing, you now have to re-incentivize them to start back up, which means the price starts to climb. And the faster your unit can ramp, the higher, the more money you're going to make, right? So the speed of ramp is the most important thing, as it turns out, to, to integrate renewables into the market. Flexibility, ramping rate is the most important thing you can possibly do. So that part of the curve is what this is all about. And here's what, it, you know, this is a little bit, this is, this is sort of historical data and has actually come to fruition. And what it says here is, is that in these three-hour ramp rates, you have to have these 15,000 megawatts can't come online, right? That's double the hydro we've got, right? We said gas is like 22,000, right? And so what happens if you take all those gas turbines out of the market? All The only units that can ramp are hydro and gas, and you just took all the gas out of the market. What do you do about it? How do you cover it? 
And the an simple answer, right, the, pot, the blue sky answer, how's that, is batteries. Okay, everyone's going to have a battery. And I love batteries. Um, um, I, you know, I've probably bought my last internal combustion engine car. I think batteries are fabulous. The te technology is great. The social cost of making batteries cover this problem nationwide, let's just talk about it nationwide, maybe even globally, there isn't enough cobalt, nickel, tungsten, and lithium on the planet to make it work. There just simply isn't. You, you're mining entire countrysides to get the amount of material you need for this battery. It's a niche market, right? So the current battery technology as we see it, even though it's fabulously more advanced than it was a decade ago, is not the solution because of the social costs of batteries, right? If we could electrify our transportation system with batteries, that's a huge leap forward in decarbonizing the economy. It is not going to solve this problem. This problem is very real, and there is no current plan for it. So that's good news. Um, all right, all right. So, so, um, so these are my predictions, and, um, and I should say probably only my predictions. Don't, don't quote me on this to my board. Um, but, but here it is. I mean, this is our future that we're facing, right? Um, and and California is good at, at fixing problems. We're pretty aspirational, right? Um, we sometimes pass really stupid legislation, but sometimes it helps focus the mind. And I think we're at that point right now. But I will tell you this: um, near term, five year, one, all the rest of the once through cooled gas units, those ones on the coast, those are all going to be gone. That's about 15% of the in-state electricity production disappears. Uh, that medium term, the SB100, that's 100% uh, carbon free. Um, uh, shutters half to three quarters of the remaining natural gas fired units in that 15 year term. That's when the serious grid complications start to arise. That's when you're starting, if you don't have another technology to replace it, you're doing serious demand management stuff. It's no longer going to be optional whether you can turn off, whether your energy company can turn off the AC at your house, it becomes mandatory. There's just no way to cover that load that I can see with current technology um, without that, right? And then the long term, there is no natural gas units. They're gone. Um, and so all that's left, the only thing left that's peaking is hydro and whatever batteries we got, but it's hydro. So to me, hydro, even though it becomes a smaller slice of the overall generation pie, its importance in covering the morning and the evening increases exponentially. That's the only thing you're going to use hydro for. You're, you're never going to use any water during the middle of the day. You're never going to use any water at night. What you're going to do is take every drop of water you have and focus it in two hours in the morning and five hours in the evening. Wholesale change. Although, I have to say, I was thinking about this when we did our licensing. Uh, uh, that was my job. Right. Okay, last set of predictions, and then I'm going to shut up and take questions. Um, there's a thing in my mind, that's dumb hydro, and then there's smart hydro. Okay, dumb hydro is base loaded, we run some water, it's run of the river, and we just pour it onto the grid, and we get paid whatever we get paid for it. And actually, um, I hope there's nobody from PG&E in the room, but, but if you just run it, if you're, if you're an investor on utility model, it, that makes some amount of sense, and you can swallow that up for your customers, but it's not optimized, and I hate things that aren't optimized. You've got this resource that has that is a battery, right? So a chemical battery, thing that powers this, has potential energy in it, but it's in the form of chemistry. Hydro has potential energy in it, but it's in the form of gravity. And so we've got batteries. We're just not deploying them in the most optimized sense. And if you're going to take all the hits of the environmental impacts of hydro, in my view, it's nearly immoral if you don't take that resource and focus it in the most efficient way possible, and you just waste it, right? And so my job is to figure out how to optimize it so that, we, yeah, we take the impacts, we mitigate them, and we do the best we can with them, but then use the resource smartly, at least, uh, for the benefit of, your, benefit of your citizens. So.
Huh? I thought she was taking your mic. I know. She, I thought that was the end of my... I thought I was done for. Okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So, 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 so pump storage is going to get built, I think. Um, Western market integration will occur, um, which means we're all hooked together as a grid, but resources from outside the state are going to be able to bid into our market to cover our needs. And incidentally, um, those same folks, the reason, they're not doing it out of the goodness of their heart to help California. What they're doing it for is when we have an excess of renewable generation and our prices are negative, we're going to pay utilities in other states to take our excess energy, right? So how good of a deal is that? If you live in Reno, all of a sudden, you're much more competitive economically to California because you're sucking up all the expensive resources that you and I paid for, and you're getting paid to take them. Fabulous deal. Invest in Reno. Um, the other thing is, um, when you do that Western market integration, I said nobody knows where everyone's electrons come from. You're going to get a bunch of dirty resources in because you can't. It's unavoidable, right? Those other states are not. They're not doing the same things we're doing on renewables, right? And so what you're going to get, Western grid integration is just a band aid. It's a band aid for that ramping problem. You're going to get a bunch of resources like coal plants in Four Corners, Utah. Or, or Arizona or Colorado, and they're, gonna, they're hungry to participate in the market, and we're so desperate because we've got to keep the lights on that we're going to buy those resources. And it's going to hurt our long-term climate strategy by buying in dirty resources from other states unless we figure out this ramping problem. So blue sky technologies, um, I'm all for blue sky. Uh, unfortunately, I, I just wish I knew what it was so I could invest in it. Um, there'll be disruptors, you know, but nothing on the radar that I see that's in front of me, you know, chemical batteries, all that stuff, compressed air, um, all those things that people want to invest in to store that non-dispatchable renewable energy that's produced during the day and dispatch it during the times when you actually need it. None of that stuff is scalable to me in an economic way to fill in the gaps. But, you know, I mean, Blue Sky is great. And if, if anybody has a tip on Blue Sky, I'll take it because I think that's where the investment comes in. So... Uh, that's what I have, and I'm happy to take questions with Amy. Is it on? All right. <laughs> um, it's funny because what I'm going to say is, uh, Probably, uh, I'm, um, I'm a bit worried about sounding woo-woo or childish, uh, bringing forward my perspective from the native perspective. <laughs> and so it, you guys can just take it, take it for how it lands with you. Um, I constantly have my grandfather in my head. And, you know, we come from, I guess... You know, the Native Americans were called um, uncivilized and, um, you know, that you don't know how to work the land. And so if they don't know how to take the resources from the land and use the land, then they shouldn't have the land. And I think it's just such a different perspective. And now I won't say that I don't play my electric bass and I like my amp and I use my air conditioner and I drive a fuel burning car. And I, I'm trying to curb my use of plastic. I'm probably the worst Indian on the whole world. I don't know. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I struggle with a lot of these things because I'm a modern contemporary woman. And I love technology. And I also can never, ever, ever, two points of my grandfather in my head. Um, one is that he actually said, don't ever get recognized because the government can do anything they want with you, which was his reality because he and all his siblings were taken away to Indian boarding school, literally forcefully removed from the homes and taken away. And here we are trying, we're fighting for federal recognition. So um, I think it's different now. I don't, I, forgive me if I sound awful. I'm just gonna be frank. I, I can't edit myself very well when I'm just speaking from my heart and try to speak from my mind, but we're lighter than we used to be. I don't have a problem walking down the street. I don't get targeted for anything. People don't know I'm a Native American. I think I could probably move and integrate into anywhere I wanted and I could leave my identity behind me. But that was not so for him. And when he grew up here and his family and his ancestors 
above him, of course. So his, the, those were one of the words that, you know, were, I always did what my grandpa said and were totally in contrary to his, don't get a roll number, it's bad for you, <laughs> which was his reality. So there's that. And the other thing that just, um, you know, I've been, I've been furking, um, you know, that I know what furk is, it's just so strange, because I just started out life as a musician, just played music, didn't ever, like, not very educated, not having uh, what my mom always hated, when are you going to get a real job, Shelly, all that kind of stuff. But I'm very educated in a million different processes, with, a, uh, feels like a million different agencies. And... I know that we're all working for the, through these problems. If I'm at home and I'm turning on my air conditioner, this applies to me. What does that mean? And the solutions um, are, again, contrary to what my grandfather would say, is that those rivers have a life. We don't know it. We can't see it. But they have a life and a knowledge beyond humans. But because the river doesn't speak and can't get mad or maybe sue us, I don't know if the river had a bank account, we might be in big trouble. But um, the rivers have their right to life. As well as, do you know, here I go where I, I really start to edit myself because I, I worry that I'm going to sound woo-woo or like so childish. Like, you know, that's really funny, but this is our problem. <laughs> you know, that today, this is what we're worried about. But the animals, most of the species during these um, environmental impact studies with the endangered species and all of our issues trying to find a solution to be having, which I am all for. I want my technology and I want to feel good doing it you know, and not feel guilty and not be um, continually fighting against my grandpa's voice in my, in my own head and in my own heart. And our species have, we've lost so much, you know, from before the gold rush, the native grasses, they say, were like 80% extinct. There's so many things that we don't have in our our purview in that we go out and see because we're used to this where I'm used to roads. My mom used to try to tell me, Oh, that old village is, you know, as a crow flies is right over the hill. And I'm like, it's a good example of where, um, <laughs> rice's crossing is. And grandpa, they, uh, three generations, um, my third great, second great grandfather, my great grandfather, my grandfather worked on every iteration of Colgate powerhouse. And they worked on every iteration of Buller's Bar Dam. My grandpa worked for pg and &E. He um, was always embarrassed that he didn't go off to the war because he was kept behind because the threat of the dams being blown up was very serious. So they kept him there at Buller's Bar. Back when he used to open the things with his hands. I mean, I, that seems like a long, long, long time ago to me. But, um, you know, we've come so far with this inherited water system. And I just always feel, you know, where are those geniuses out there? We've got to find them. How, where do we get the technology to dump that extra energy when we don't need it? Like, it's a fear. Like, how can the thing that we want also be the thing we don't want, right? We want clean energy, but, oh, no, there's too much energy now. So, you know, where is the genius technology that's burning that, that um, you know, so we don't get too much energy in the grid? And where are those technologies that act like batteries? I mean, that's where, you know, in my heart, that's the little piece where we should be focusing all of our energies. Where are these kids? How are we schooling them in both the environmental heart and the need for protection and the ability to have our technology, you know, and this is totally me being selfish. I want it all. <laughs> I want it all. I want to feel good about, um, and I also get very I'm very selfish where I will feel sorry for myself if somebody says, well, you, you know, you really shouldn't be using your energy past five because you know how much it costs. And I'm like, oh. like, that's my moment to sit at home and do my things. And it's hot and I want my air conditioner on. Yet I tend to feel bad about that. So I, I know that voice isn't always um, the voice that fits into all these conversations. But I also believe that... Um, you know, we can do a stop and about face if the general population wants that. 
And sometimes I think we have to do that. I mean, that's why boycotts happen. That's why people strike. That's why all these things, um, you know, but what's, it's not just stop. We don't like it. And we're going to stomp our feet and throw it on this man over here and be like, what are you going to do about it? You know, <laughs> where's my energy? And I don't like that either, but we've got to figure out how that stop about face can happen. And just remember again, Sorry, I just keep, I have my big sorry in my apology sign up all the time. Is we've got to remember the environment. We've got to remember the forest health. I mean, we're all seeing it now. You know, healthy forests are not healthy for people, unhealthy meadows. I go to all these conferences with the healthy meadows and the water and the forest. And, you know, they're also, well, they feel disconnected to me because I'm so green. It's still after 10 years, I'm so green and naive to all the processes. But I'm learning, and there's got to be. Um, some kind of convergence of wanting both. I understand the almighty dollar is the almighty dollar and why it's the almighty dollar, you know? I participate in this economic system. But we can, if we can just always keep that in the back of our mind of so much is gone, so much has been lost. This is an inherited water system. This is an inherited um, thing we have in gold country, all across the gold country. Um, but it doesn't have to be this way. And I'm too naive, like you were saying, you're not an economics person. I'm absolutely not an engineer, <laughs> nor am I a fish biologist or any of the things I wish I could be at any given moment. But that voice of the past, I think there's a lot of wisdom in it. And if we don't all come together and find, take all these beautiful minds in the room and find that magic solution um you know and if we make money too okay but i i also feel that you know i guess i can just say i do most of my work for free i'm i feel like my culture is endangered we only have 144 people left in our tribal membership and i'm pretty much just laying the rest of, you know, I can't burn at this light that much longer, I don't think. But, um, you know, I'm laying it all on the line for, for what I feel is a really good cause. And I think we can all do that with the environment always in our heart. And how, how, can, we, how can we do that together with all these brilliant minds out there? So um, that's all I wanted to say. I hope it doesn't sound too naive. And, um, you know, it's like, yeah, but you don't know about the world economy and all these kind of things. But the engine that turns us is the planet. Yes. Yeah, so 1963 was mentioned at least twice in these presentations, the year the Nisenan lost their mm -hmm. federal recognition, and the year of PG&E's contract with what was not only Placer County Water Agency, but also with NID for the 80 or more river impoundments in the Yuba watershed. And also, um, Yuba County Water Agency was making contracts with PG&E in 1963 for the, even the biggest hydropower project in the Yuba watershed, the New, New Bullard Spar. So I thank you for being here so we can try to consider what a 66-year perspective is when taking on the, the future of hydropower. And I think Amy might have a comment to share about the... Uh, ineptitude of our environmental regulatory process. Don't let me put words in your mouth. I, I, those are mine. I worked for seven years, put more than seven, you know, more than any other project for seven years, the uh, environmental regulatory process to plan these improvements for the river. And it was the most discouraging thing I ever worked on hard. And I try to work on hard things. Uh, so, um, how do we incorporate a 66-year perspective given the constraints of the energy market and all the different costs, the regulatory system, which is failing us, certainly in this watershed, um, but if we don't, you know, we're going to waste a lot of precious resources. So, how can we incorporate that? I'd love to get an answer from all three of you. Great. Would you mind repeating the question? 
Yeah, so um, Gary is asking, how can we get a, that 66-year perspective from here into the future? How do we pull together with the, as Gary says, I don't want to, I'm not saying this if somebody's watching me, <laughs> the failure of the regulatory process, um, you know, and the constraints that we have today. And um, uh, it, it's... You know, the fight for federal recognition just for the tribe um, is intergenerational. Uh, my mom was our first tribal chairwoman of the Nevada City Rancheria. Uh, Richard Johnson's a chairperson now. Um, it, now a lot of this falls on my shoulders because I'm of the generation and of the age that I can, my daughter's 27, I can get up and move and pretty much most every day and function and get out there and do what needs to be done. But the perspective... I'm just, now I'm going to go over to my doom and gloom, Shelly. Um, I, I don't have my magic wand on this one. But our perspective is, is the total, almost complete destruction of the Nisanon has already happened. You know, we were a thriving, wealthy, spiritual, had our own economy, tended the land for thousands of years, um, you know, worked with fire, worked with all the animals, had deep, deep religion, um, great reverence for the land because nature really was religion with I got and the other spiritual beings that we um, commune with and were part. Oh, my heart, sorry. <laughs> um, you know, that... I also worked with salmon in the Eagle Watershed, and That's they right. are going extinct. The circle knows and has an explaining yeah. out there. So I, I thank you for that, and yeah. let's hear what we can yeah. try to make sense of the plan. And, and, I, and I'll just, I, with the salmon, yeah. with where we've gone by way of the condor, the salmon, the wolf, the grizzly bear, um, in our perspective, Almost everything has been lost anyway. I'm not trying to say that this world isn't great and that I'm not enjoying life and loving my community and everything that we have left. But it can all be lost at any given minute if we, if we don't shape up. And we do follow, um, you know, salmon was our main source here, along with the great elk antelope and the elk herds that were here that are all they're all gone so when we're talking about environmental regulations to get the flow and the temperature just right for a few of the few remaining wild the species that live here um, I know what that feels like I really do and but it's our world right now and it's how we feel right now and those are our focuses right now but what has been lost from you know, 2,000 years ago and the families that what they remember, we just don't remember it because we're living now. And so when we lose something, we lose a species, it impacts us. But what's already been lost is so great that it's hard for me to not um, feel quite depressed, like Gary's saying about a lot of these things. But I know that we're working with an entire nation, you know, and the Nisanon people worked within families and small tribal groups. And that's how you kept the control and the, the camaraderie and the the um, conversation moving forward. So it's harder. So but I would absolutely defer this over to you guys because I don't want to be the doom and gloom Shelly. <laughs> no, uh, Shelly, that's a really good perspective actually. And so, so Gary, on your question, I mean, I think that for um, public utilities, water agencies, um, it's not just a 66 year sort of vision. It's, I mean, we're here forever. I mean, we, we are the community. We are here to supply the community with critical sort of life-giving water supplies and in some cases energy, right? And it, you know, economics is just a science around society, right? And so our job is really, we don't have a lifespan. We're not a corporation that's looking for a margin for a certain amount of time and then we get out of the business. I mean, this is, we are here forever. That's our job. And so that means, you know, we have water, we have energy and we have stewardship in our, in our name. We did that very specifically because that last part is something that I think was ignored. We did that actually in on our 50 year anniversary about 12 years ago um, because we felt like 
uh, that was a missing piece for a large part of the agency's history because it was a missing piece from a large part of the consciousness of the folks that lived here. And so times change, um, our citizens adapt, and that means our institutions adapt. And I think you'll see that in a lot of places um, in local government. That's why we happen to prefer local government to a lot of other solutions because we're most responsive to our citizens, right? And citizens change how local governments act by the power of showing up, right? That's what we are. And so, um, you know, just to think about that stewardship piece, it's not just the mitigations or how we go through licensing, um, although that's an important part of it, but it's, a, it's kind of a small part when you think about what we're doing for things like watershed management and and forest management, which is a new mission for local water agencies. It was very, very difficult for us to participate in that because we kind of thought that the federal government had that part of it covered, and it turns out that it actually, it's a lot better if we do it in partnership, right? And so um, what we're figuring out is those partnerships across um, state, federal, local, and the, and the local community groups um, to make better things happen together and that's just the way the society's demanding that we do business, and it's actually a better way for us to do business, and I think it's gonna help us in our sustainability, not only our sort of economic sustainability, but our sustainability when it comes to, to things like stewardship. So, oh, Amy, you have anything? Um, I don't know, there's a lot going on in this conversation. <laughs> Um, I first want to just acknowledge what Shelley said because, um, I mean, first of all, nothing you said should be, was that I hear as childish. I heard it as an incredible, you know, historic, ancestral perspective, so I really appreciate it. And, um, and, and actually, you identified something that has um, that been identified by scientists in the ecological literature, this, this sort of idea of the shifting, it's called the shifting baseline, where you kind of forget, you're at a new place, and you forgot all the other things that have been lost. Now you're at this new place. And, and in hydropower relicensing, we, all, we unfortunately, because of the way the regulatory system works, we sort of start out at the, okay, the project is here. We're starting from here, the project's here, now what can we do going forward? And I'm, I'm a little maybe more of a glass half full person and I saw a lot of what I thought were, you know, pretty good successes in the collaborative of the relicensing realm. But it is always starting from that new baseline of, you know, things that we've already forgotten that we've lost and we, we don't even know we, we're missing them. Um, but yeah, like um, I, I mentioned the, the whole snowmelt recession piece of the flow regime, that's something that seemed to work well for the licensees and the recreation perspective that could you know, do whitewater boating at that springtime and it was good for frogs that were adapted to that springtime flow regime. And so, um, I mean, I think I saw a lot of positive interactions in those collaboratives and I, and I think also what Andy's talking about going forward, you can kind of take that energy, that partnership energy, and that is how, and I'm not as tuned in to the, the projects that Andy's talking about. If our forest supervisor was here, I'm sure he could speak much more eloquently about it. But, um, but that is the hope that I have, is that we can continue to work together in partnership and that that is where those problems will be solved. You know, maybe not solved, but we'll start solving, you know, we'll get closer. And, um, that's the best way to go forward, so. Okay, well we got the workshop part of this already kicked off. Yeah. Can I get another round of applause for our incredible speakers? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so for the next 20 minutes, uh, I would like to invite the, the lovely audience as well as those on the live stream. If you comment on the live stream video, we'll try to get your question read and have the panelists answer. I also have a couple moderated questions that we can start off with, but I think that was a really engaging question. Thank you, Gary, to, to kick off the discussion. Um, 
the mic is live here at the front. We do have a recording, so please, if you would like and are comfortable asking your question in person, please come up here, sit down, and say your question into the mic so everyone can hear you. If not, we have bright pink cards that are being circulated by our wonderful staff members, and raise your hand and they will give you a card, and we will also read those to our panelists. Would you like to start? Please come up here. Say your name if you could. Thank you. My name is Steve Reynolds. Uh, my question uh, involves the pumped, uh, the pumped water energy where you pump into a reservoir, drain it out. Um, I would assume that you use the peak solar energy to pump it up and then you drain it out, you get your morning energy and your evening energy. Uh, given our uh, rainfall records, um, question remains, uh, will we have enough water? Is there space for that? How do you keep that water from evaporating through the process so that it doesn't get wasted so you actually have a sustainable system? And if we get five years of drought, we still have the capability of doing this. Who would like to start, Andy? <laughs> nice and nice and close to the mouth. Um, yeah. So, um, so it's a good question. So, so anytime you got water in a in a reservoir, you're going to get evaporation, right? No doubt of that. And um, it's not really manageable. It's just a thing you got to manage around. Um, so the 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 beauty of gravity, right, is that is that it you can do a lot with a relatively small amount of water if you're just trying to focus on those areas where you have problems. So if you only need three hours of energy, but you need a lot of it in that three hours, it actually takes a remarkably small volume of water to make that work. So um, <coughs> Sacramento Municipal Utility District had a project called Iowa Hill that they were planning on building, and it was about 2,000 feet of gravity, um, and the, the, one of the reservoirs was on top of a mountain, and it was actually relatively small in the scheme of things, much smaller than, you know, New Bullards or my reservoirs. It's just a small thing because all you needed was a couple thousand acre feet of water to, to get you through that evening peak, right? And so the smaller the reservoir, the less evaporation. <coughs> um, and, and if you've already got reservoirs built, so PCWA has got two big reservoirs on, on the hill and there's 600 feet of elevation difference between the reservoirs, that water is evaporating no matter what. So again, back to the ethics of if you've already done the damage to the ecosystem to build those things, why not add on the part that helps you get through that, that peak and you've got the water, it's evaporating anyways, you might as well put it to the greatest beneficial use. That's how we sort of look at that. Um, those other big projects, similar things, they need to be refilled every once in a while and there's no doubt that you have to refill them. But again, I think that in the greater scheme of things of sort of when you think about Lake Shasta or Lake Oroville or New Bullards or even my reservoirs, there's a lot of evaporation happening there anyway, and we're managing those for water supplies. Adding on those pieces of pumped hydro, you can do it badly, I'll admit that, but I think you can do it really well too at very, very addition, low additional environmental impact. Pump storage, is that enough? <laughs> Does that answer it? Yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ray Bryans, Nevada City. Um, I thought some of the stuff you showed was very positive, where you had that much so extra solar in the middle of the day. Could we incentivize businesses to provide a lot of charges for all the people that are going to have their battery-powered vehicles so that you could bring that down and also they wouldn't have to charge them in the evening when they go home? Um, yeah, yeah, that's part of the solution, right? And so, so if the, so electrifying the transportation system is the surest way to decarbonize the economy. That, so that's a statement and an opinion in one, but it is a fact. And so if you can deploy those transportation resources to also be your batteries, mm -hmm. um, you, you, you get a you get a double benefit from it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that is part of what I think the future holds, right? It it 
carries the additional burden of um, rewiring our homes and businesses, you know, which is not an insignificant thing, right? I mean, if you live in an older house, you know that, like, each room has one plug, and if you turn on your hairdryer and your microwave, your main breaker blows, right? I mean, that's, that's a fact. And so, so to take that home of that vintage and say, all right, now I want you to do this advanced charging thing and swap energy back and forth to the grid is not an insignificant hurdle. And so it's just a cost-benefit. Not to the grid, to charge all the employees' cars while they're at work using the energy. Yeah, yeah, and no, no, I get that, right. And so, so, so you want to, but then you want to, you want them to take that car home mm -hmm. and charge the grid when you need it. To. Right, right, I mean, so that's the, so that's yeah. your triple yeah. benefit, right? Yeah. And so, yeah. so, so, yeah, that's the blue sky thing. Okay. We're moving in that direction. Great. And it's, it just comes back to costs, right? So what can the consumer bear, right? So an average home solar installation is about a $9,000 installation to power your, to cover your needs, to add batteries to actually make it so you could go off grid, blue sky, is another eighteen thousand dollars on top of that. Okay, so you're at twenty six grand to be off grid, right? That's pretty intense investment for a lot of folks in California. If you live in Silicon Valley, if you live in Beverly Hills, that's pretty much like tip change. But, it, but a lot of folks can't make that work, right? And so incentivizing that through the tax code and other ways is possible. Um, the large-scale deployment of it, we're not quite there on technology. In five years, we'll be there. Thank you. Amy or Shelley, would you like to weigh in on, on that question? No. That's fair. <laughs> okay. Kurt? Um, Kurt Lorenz. Um, and it interests me that we're not talking about efficiencies or inefficiencies uh, that could be applied by um, local size, local scale electrical systems rather than re uh, relying on the existing grid. Um, I've seen some sources that indicate, and I, I do not know if this is accurate, that by the time you look at the uh, distribution losses in the grid, let's say in in the western grid coming from Bonneville Dam and you know going all over hell and gone, that as much as half of that power disappears in heat uh, that's lost in the transmission system. And even if it, that sounds really hard to believe, but even if it were a third of it that's lost, there's, it may be that we grew into the grid as an obvious way to do business, just like we grew into a lot of other things, but it's actually a crappy way to do it. And um, um, I've lived off the grid for almost 40 years now and gone through the whole development of tiny, super expensive solar panels up to really inexpensive and, you know, scalable systems. Um, but I question, without being able to say exactly why, I'm just raising the question, is a nationwide distributed grid the way to do this? My suspicion is that it's just, it's just what we're stuck with. And we ought to be thinking about this in more depth. So I think, Kurt, maybe one of your, I think if I captured your comment slash question, why aren't we thinking about more efficiencies on the local scale rather than accepting Right, and why aren't we thinking about small regional systems right. that where the transmission di differences are not great and local management is possible, um, and um, we're not connected into this behemoth that loses power constantly. Talk about CCAs. Well, okay. So, um, so uh, things grow organically, including the grid, right? So. 
human societies grow organically. Um, the national grid is an expression of risk mitigation. So let me give you an example. If Nevada County relied on um, only NID's hydropower, which actually I think that the, if I'm remembering the numbers right, the capacities match up pretty well. NID's hydropower operation could power Nevada County. Let's just take that at face value. Okay. On average, and that's the key. Yeah. Risk mitigation about being hooked to your neighbors and their neighbors being hooked to their neighbors is about what happens during drought years when my hydropower production is only 20% of average. And now I gotta tell Shelly, she can only pay, play her base 20% of the time, and that's gonna make her unhappy. She's mad. Right, she's <laughs> gonna be angry about that, right? And so, so the grid, just like our water system in California, is hooked in as a society to mitigate risk between regions, in my view. Mm -hmm. and, um, so could you scale that back and say, yeah, but, but we're too hooked together? Maybe. In the, in the generation of renewables that I see coming, which California is a leader in, which other states will follow in, the risk mitigation becomes a much larger factor. Because if the wind's blowing in Wyoming, which every time I go to Wyoming, the wind seems to be blowing. And, and, and so that's great, right? But the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine in California that geographical distribution of renewables turns out to be a much more important thing in order to keep us all less reliant on carbon, right? Burning carbon to keep reliability, because reliability is a big thing. And the more technology penetration we have in our society, the more 60 hertz, 60 cycles per second, and full voltage make a huge difference, right? It was different 100 years ago when all you had to do was keep an incandescent light burning in a house. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah, and so I think that's what it is. I think it's risk mitigation. I think with renewables, what we're going to find is um, regional diversification and regionalization is even more important than it was in the past. I understand your losses thing. There are plenty of losses in the system, no doubt, but <coughs> I think the benefits outweigh the, the negatives. I think. Okay, thank you. Shelly, would you like to weigh in on that question at all? I mean, I, I have, of course, I have a perspective as always. <laughs> I just feel so silly saying these things. Um, you know, that's the. Can I can I just say these words without getting in trouble from anybody? You know, that's assimilation into our current nation. It's what we do, and you know, we all want it fast and easy. Um, for lack of better words, and when it might seem more independent or um, maybe it'll be a new fad that we all do. Maybe, maybe that's where Ricky go. She gone? Maybe we need to start nudging, telling NID that's what we want. I don't know. Um, but it's the same with, you know, our great nation and the, the states who want to stand on their own. And, you know, um, it's, just, it's just the world we live in right now. And it's the monopolies of McDonald's. And, again, I participate there, and I'm trying not to, um, to be a better person and not have that stuff and fall into that hole of things but it is it is grown organically i suppose but maybe also um you know that monopoly of things too that puts us in these states that we forget what it could be like to be different and independent sovereign is the word i suppose <laughs> thank you would you like to show? Sure. yeah okay. um Mm -hmm. Dash of water. Um, so I have two questions. So it sounds like some of the biggest draws on the grid are heating and cooling. That's right. So how much are passive solar technologies in homes, um, better insulation and things like that, that will potentially actually reduce the demand going to be a part <laughs> of the future to equalizing out the the supply and demand if we're having trouble meeting supply with these like highly um, responsive kinds of power um, to actually reducing demand across the state or country, et cetera, by um, reducing the, 
the need for heating and cooling. So that's one question. And the other is um, the wave technologies that they're using to generate power that presumably is a renewable but um, doesn't necessarily go up or down with the daylight hours. Um, is that a possibility here in California? Um, I know that they're experimenting with that in Scandinavia. I don't know where we're at with that technology, but is something like that being looked at here in California? So, yeah, uh, on the efficiency thing, um, yeah, it, it, the, the work that I've seen on that um, is that it's way more efficient to tighten up your home or your business than it is to try to add generation to your home, right? I mean, it's just, it's like three to one. It's, it's, it's a no-brainer, right? And so, um, yeah, I mean, part of... Uh, part of this energy push to decarbonize the grid is everything has to be tight and right, as tight as you can make it, right? And, and that's, again, it's, it goes to investment, right? It's, it's just all about, you know, do folks have the money? Can you incentivize them through the tax code? We did it in 2008-ish, 2010-ish. We incentivized during the recession um, tightening up homes, right? And it worked pretty well, actually. Um, at the same time, electrifying more stuff, right? And so, so when you think about decarbonizing the grid, I mean it from the standpoint of burning fossil fuels to generate electricity, right? But you also have, you know, your water heater and your stove and your furnace, right, which are burning fossil fuels directly in your house. And the idea of decarbonizing our sort of economy is also to replace those things with electric. Right, And so at the same time you're tightening up your house and reducing your demand, you're shifting more of your native load right at your home, at your doorstep to electric too. And so, so I see the growth of, of electric demand far outpacing the, any efficiency gains. I mean, they're important, they're super important, but I just see everything going back to electric. I remember, I don't know, there's plenty of people old enough in this room to remember, but. But I remember when I was growing up, there was a sticker on the front window of my house, and it said that we were a golden medallion home. Everybody remember that? Yeah. All right. And what that meant was everything you had was electric, which was a fabulous marketing ploy um, at the time. Um, but it was this badge of honor that everything in your house was electric. And I, I was joking with the folks at PG&E. I said, you got to bring that sticker back <laughs> um, because that's what we're doing, right? We're going everything is going back to electric because why? You can control emissions better at the grid scale than you can at the home scale. Mm -hmm. and, and so that makes sense, right? If you've got a big industrial in, in installation, you can control those emissions much better if you electrify the grid if you have a, a single point of emissions versus having a million, and in California's case, 40 million. And so that's what I think is it's just that load growth on electricity side is just going to be really large. I, I just, I, so, so I'm, I'm really sensitive to what you're saying. I, I agree. You can maybe change the tide. It's just that when you look at the slope of the line and the trend. Oh boy, do I hear that? It, you know, the moment. You know, there's a real, there's a real power in momentum, and the momentum is one direction. And so when you're, when you're folks like us, when you're utilities, when you see that momentum. It's sort of your responsibility to respond to the momentum. If the momentum shifts in a different direction, we can respond to it. But that momentum in this country is really hard to shift, and it's one direction. It's, it's load growth and well, electricity. And that's how I feel, and that's what I say every time I'm arguing with my grandfather in my head. You it, know? It's momentum. Right? He's like, don't get recognized, but that is the momentum in the moment right now. So. Right. But I'm glad to know that I live in a gold star house because we don't have gas. <laughs> so I learned something tonight. <laughs> Thank you all. I, I know we have only a couple minutes, and if people will bear with me as we maybe go over a little over, but I wanted to bring it back, just one last question, to bring us back to why we are here tonight, which is looking at the future of hydropower 
from all these incredible diverse stakeholders and these changes that are coming our way that now you've gotten a little piece of what those all mean to our community and the situation that we're facing, which is dire. But you're hearing a lot of hope, hopefully, from our speakers too of that we have been in hundreds of meetings together, hundreds of emails. We have this dialogue going on and so I so appreciate you taking the time to hear little pieces of what we believe we need to move forward, but we need to move forward together. And so if all three of you wouldn't mind answering this question, I would really appreciate it. Do you believe that hydropower can become a net environmental benefit focused on recovering endangered species and restoring healthy forests, ideally healthy watersheds, while remaining economically viable? Who would like to start? I'll start because I don't want to end on that question. <laughs> Just a belief. Well, I've, I've always personally felt that it was the less of the evils, you know, for a long time. Um, I have so much hope and faith in the new emerging technologies. I just hope something out there is going to be um, created by some little, you know, millennial or younger and, you know, in some lab somewhere, <laughs> you know, who knows it's going to come. I mean, that's how most of the technology comes anyway, right, is on, on somebody's, uh, somebody's brilliance and the need for that. Um, I hope so. I hope so. Um, I, the tribes are being consulted in all of these processes. Um, I'm trying to build my capacity and the tribe's capacity to be responsive. So we're finally like, we want to be involved. And then you get all these letters and it's like, oh my God, why did I, what have I done? <laughs> so, um, but I know, you know, and I was saying earlier that my grandpa and his generation and his parents were never consulted on any of the, anything that went on here. So that has absolutely changed and I hope that all of our government officials and um, all the stakeholders and players always remember you know the tribe is it's struggling I mean it's seriously a critically endangered um, people you know and, um, and not to play the fiddle but uh, it's right we're right along in the in the barrel that's a horrible way to put it in the barrel with the other endangered um, species in the in the earth so just keeping that wisdom of you know remember remember when I'm playing my bass and hauling butt down the road to Sacramento every day, how much missions am I making? Um, I try to keep that in my, as my center. And I hope so. I hope, I hope that um, anything clean, that, like he had said, the damage, is, the ben, damage has been done. I mean, I want to see all the rivers run free. That's my personal hope if I had my Shelly wand. And I wouldn't know what to do about any of the economic anything because I'd be like, I don't know. Oh, well, the river's free. <laughs> So that, that's where my heart is, is for the water and the species. And, um, but I do still really want to play my bass. So. <laughs> thank you, Shelley. And thank you again for being here. Thank you. Andy, Amy. Yeah, so, um, so, so uh, uh, emphatically, yes, actually. Um, so I think that um, in particular, Sierra Nevada, sort of our regional system of high elevation watersheds, impoundments, hydropower facilities, with the tweaks we've made in the last decade, with the science we have and how we're gonna reoperate these systems, I hope to get a license soon. I think NID will have one, Yuba's gonna have one soon. Look, we recognize that, that we spent a lot of time operating them in a way just because we didn't know any better, right? And so the hope is you've gotten smarter. I think we have as, as a group, and I mean that as all the stakeholders, have gotten smarter about what's important. And, and giving up, in my case, I think we gave up something like, you know, 4% or 5% of our generation potential. And honestly, we were happy to do it because we retained the flexibility to help with this existential problem of climate change, right? We're happy to put our resource to work on that problem and giving up 5% of the generation which is the lowest value stuff was fine because what we did was we were able to do things like the snow melt recession stuff, which we figured out through science is like one of the best uses of water we can put water to, right? And so we're getting smarter about this stuff. We're getting smarter every year about this stuff. And as a replacement or a mitigation for a warming climate, this goes to your, how do you help species recover? Um, we've got some of the best resources around to do that because our reservoirs are at the highest elevations 
And while they are going to be impacted with lower snowpack, right, because we sized our reservoirs to have a snow reservoir too, and if a snow reservoir goes away, it, it decreases the efficiency of the structures we've built because now your peak flows are higher and you flood more and you don't get to conserve as much water. We're going to figure a way around that. We'll remanage the system. But we have those tools in our local communities owned by all of us in this room as citizens of Yuba, Nevada, and Placer County. You know, we've got those resources at our disposal and they're going to help all the way down through the Bay Delta system and all the way down through the ocean because we're going to have some of the last coldest water available in the state. Mm -hmm. And putting that to use to help all the way downstream is that's what we do, right? That's what we do. And um, it's what our citizens demand and that's what we're going to do. So I'm absolutely bullish on the potential of that, uh, of that question. Well, hmm. I'm not sure I'm glass half full on this one. I'm a, I'm a maybe. I'm a maybe just because uh, there's so many moving parts in the future. And, um, you know, we did our best with, you know, coming up with these license conditions. We haven't seen them implemented yet. We don't have monitoring data. I'm trained as a scientist, so I'm, I, I can't quite go there to emphatically yes, but I'm a maybe on that, that we can leverage the hydropower projects to address some of the critical species issues, the cold water species in particular, um, that have lost access to those habitats. Um, but that is in the context of making sure that we are doing other things in other parts of the watershed that are um, also providing protections for for a different suite of species potentially. Um, so uh, maybe. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, again. Round of, last round of applause, I promise. Thank you all again for coming. We have our third workshop in this quarterly series during the Wild and Scenic Film Festival on January 18th. Um, and time and place to be determined, but it will be on the theme of climate change and water. So stay tuned. Exciting more uh, information will be coming your way. We will have also a debrief uh, e-news article from this event to summarize all the information you just heard, which was quite a bit tonight, um, and to make sure that we are taking action together as a community, um, where, whatever form that takes to help address some of these <laughs> critical issues that we raised here tonight and that we need all of your help and input to do. So thank you again. Please come again. and. Contact Circle, and please become members. <laughs> Thank you again. Here.